Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank Carl and Karen Bowen for supporting the Mises Institute and in particular for sponsoring my talk today. Yesterday, Bob Murphy took a little shot at the old man here. <laughs> and it, it, you know, it kind of reminded me of old times, you know, it's how we all, how we used to be. And the thing is, I think the last time I did that to him was in Vienna. And the problem there was the Europeans didn't really know about the relationship that Bob and I have. Some of you in this room know that Bob and I used to host for five years the Contra Krugman podcast and that we've known each other and worked together for a very long time and that part of that relationship involves taking little shots at each other. Well, over, over in Europe, they just thought I was being mean. <laughs> so my joke fell flat. We were over there, I was getting an award and so I gave a speech and I was thanking people uh, who had helped contribute to my receiving the award. And at the end, I said, now here was the line I used. I said, and I'd also like to thank Bob Murphy for not being quite good enough to win the award himself. <laughs> okay. All right. In that ballroom, you could have heard a pin drop. <laughs> Didn't work at all. Did not fly. So I couldn't be happier to be here in the good old USA with you red-blooded Americans who get me. All right, all the same, let's talk about our topic today. When I heard that we were gonna be loosely basing the talks around the theme, Our Enemy, the State, I came up with the title, Our Enemy, Public Health. Because I think since 2020, any thinking person is now aware of the problems with so-called public health. As a matter of fact, just days ago, Dr. Vinay Prasad of the University of California, San Francisco, was speaking about this theme we hear in public health circles, that we need to restore faith in public health. He says, I don't want to restore faith in public health. He says, quote, public health deserves to be distrusted. Good man. <laughs> public health in general is an intellectual train wreck. It's a wholly politicized branch of so-called medicine that involves a seemingly endless series of false claims and ideological gobbledygook. I mean, remember, racism is a public health issue as justification for why otherwise you have to be locked in your house, but you can go out to protest what happened with George Floyd. No self-respecting discipline speaks or thinks that way. Now, we should have denounced public health sooner and written books about it sooner. And I think before COVID, we just didn't pay enough attention to it. We just certainly weren't paying enough attention, uh, as much attention as it deserved. Now that's partially because its overreach wasn't quite so great in those days, but also because we have a lot to criticize. You know, we have the Fed, we have the IRS, we have all the cabinet departments, we have civil liberties violations. I mean, it's exhausting being us. You can't do everything. So let's not reproach ourselves too much. But beyond all this, they also want to impose their plans on you uh, without having to deal with such mundane things as judges, courts, laws. So for example, you'll recall how unhappy Anthony Fauci was when a federal judge overturned the mask mandate on planes. Now, by the way, the reason they were unhappy that the mask mandate on planes was overturned was not that they thought we'd all get sick. The reason was that they knew we wouldn't get sick. And then we'd start wondering, well, gee, I wonder what else has been pointless that they've been pushing on us. That's a very, that is a very important question to start asking. But he was very unhappy. He said, this is a matter for public health to decide and not properly a matter for the judiciary. Well, you know what? Tony, nobody actually consented to a dictatorship run by, I shudder even to think about it, public health officials whose 24-7 barrage of false claims survives only because no mainstream media outlets, you know, bother to question them. Now, let me read you a passage from a book you may not have read, but whose author I am sure you know. Quote, we believe that an insidious agenda is being pursued in the name of public health, the use of the coercive power of the state by special interest groups who use health issues for two broad purposes. First, 
public health matters are a smokescreen to camouflage self-interested behavior, or what economists call rent-seeking. Put simply, health activists lobby for legislation, primarily tax increases that are earmarked for their particular causes, and regulations at all levels of government that benefit them financially. Second, health issues are used to advance an ideological agenda, an agenda which, without exception, fosters an enhanced role for the state in every aspect of our lives and in our lifestyles. Every government bureaucrat is inherently an empire builder, and fabricating public health scares has become an ideal technique for garnering political support for bureaucratic empire building and increased budgets to alleviate the crises." Unquote. Now, the book in question is called From Pathology to Politics, Public Health in America, and it sounds like it was written last week. In fact, it was written nearly a quarter of a century ago, and its co-author is our own Tom DiLorenzo. When Tom is not busy predicting the future, he is president of the Mises Institute. After COVID and the magnifying glass that we've had on the public health establishment, we are now much more aware of its, shall we say, imperial intentions, and that it foolishly considers itself qualified to weigh in on every issue under the sun that might potentially impact health. But here's what Tom was already writing a quarter century ago, quote, the American Public Health Association APHA, I'll make a future reference to it, uh, the Trade Association of the Public Health Movement has used its resources to develop a platform for the promotion of government-controlled medical care, the abolition of the Second Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, a governmental takeover of child care, an expansion of government's role in economic planning, and other social and economic issues. The public health movement is no longer interested primarily in the eradication of disease, it, it claims to offer expertise on virtually every social issue from poverty to human rights, unquote. So that has actually been going on for a long time. It didn't just start in the past five years. Now, I have bad news for you. Tom's book is out of print. So you have to buy my book, Diary of a Psychosis, which is available over on the book tape. I had to get a used copy of Tom's book. It cost me 40 bucks. You know, so I got to sell a whole bunch of these just to break even. Be break even on that. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. Now, several months ago, our, our Surgeon General Vivek Murthy declared, firearm violence is a public health crisis in America that poses a serious threat to the health and well-being of our country, unquote. He then proceeded to lay out every debunked claim on behalf of gun control that you've ever heard. But as Tom pointed out in that passage just a moment ago, this is nothing new for public health. Just a lot of us haven't been paying attention. We haven't noticed because we've been busy. Now, let's take a brief look at the theme of the APHA's annual convention in 1996. I guarantee you would much, much rather be at the Mises Institute Supporter Summit than be at that thing. Their annual convention was called Empowering the Disadvantaged, Social justice in public health. Now, was the keynote speaker a physician, uh, maybe a professor at a medical school, something you might think would belong there? No, guess who the, guess who the keynote speaker was? The president of the AFL-CIO, John Sweeney. And he told everyone there that he wanted them to, quote, help us rejuvenate the labor movement, unquote. Now, that is a bit far of a stretch to attach that to public health, but that's what it's about. And incidentally, the conference also called for, quote, radical redistribution of wealth, unquote, because, quote, living in an unjust society damages physical health, unquote. Okay? These people are crazier than you thought. <laughs> Tom also found that in the August 1996 issue of Health Education Quarterly, widely circulated within the CDC, we find this quotation. 
policy, policy advocacy skills for creating social change must be provided to community groups rather than, for example, providing individuals with skills so that they can make better personal choices, unquote. So in the old days, that was more or less what they thought their role was. We'll try to give you the information you need to be informed and make good decisions about your health. That's kind of old hat now. What we need to teach now is how to agitate for political change. All right. Now, one of the things that public health has claimed to really be oh so concerned about is children. Your children in particular, they care so deeply about them. Nothing, nothing concerns them more than the health of your children. Now, I'll say in parentheses, there was a moment over the past few years when there was a desire to get parents to get on board with getting the COVID shots for their kids. And so the propaganda ramped up insanely during that time. And we began to hear a report, and this was echoed by the White House, by professors at, uh, at Harvard, uh, by uh, the uh, Surgeon General, everybody was repeating it, that COVID was a top five killer of children. And they were saying this for obvious reasons. You know, you've got to hurry up and get those kids in there. Now this, I mean, you can imagine the strength of the evidence for a claim like that. So it was a woman, a lay woman in Georgia named Kelly Cronert, who just looked at it and said, well, this is just false. And she demonstrated why it was false. And it was so embarrassing to these people, they actually had to withdraw this claim. Now, there's no way they thought that was true. There's no way they thought a lot of kids are dying because of this thing. No possible way they could have thought that. And a woman who, I don't know what her educational background is, but she's not in medicine. She's just a normal person who can read data, stood up and said, this is all false, and they had to withdraw it. I mean, these people are very rarely capable of embarrassment. For, so for them to withdraw something, it has to be pretty bad. That's their concern for your kids right there. They just make stuff up to make you do what they, what they want you to do. So one of the things that they've advocated is, is expanding the welfare state, because that'll help the kids. That has been awesome for kids. Kids who grow up uh, receiving welfare do really, really awesome later in life, they think. But again, there's some very interesting research on this, and uh, Tom's book talks about a lot of it. We have evidence that the longer a child's family stays on welfare, the lower that child's IQ tends to be. And no, it's not a function of poverty per se. You can control for that and just look at people on welfare. And specifically, it is the welfare that seems to have these effects. So children, in a survey of five-year-olds, children who spent at least two months of each year, beginning at birth, on AFDC, the old program, had cognitive abilities 20% below those who had received no welfare. And that's when you control for uh, race, you control for wealth, you control for the IQ of the parents. I mean, it's, it's a startling thing. So, so they're oh so concerned about children, so they're going to advocate politically fashionable things and then not bother to check up on how's it going? How's it actually going? It's been found that being on welfare negatively impacts the future earning potential of young men. Young women raised in families dependent on welfare are two to three times more likely to drop out and fail to graduate than similar young women not on welfare. Single mothers whose families received welfare when they themselves were children, on average, remain on welfare longer when they themselves become parents. Now, they tell us that poverty and unemployment can have negative health consequences, and no doubt that is indeed true. But they go from there to proposing stupid and counterproductive government policy that will only create more poverty and unemployment. Now, when it came to COVID, none of this alleged concern for poverty or unemployment was anywhere to be found, even though this was the precise moment when we needed it. So in a thorough overview of the literature, Kevin Bardosh says as follows, the promotion of lengthy social distancing restrictions by governments and scientific experts during the COVID crisis had severe consequences for hundreds of millions of people. Many original predictions are broadly supported by the cumulative research data presented in this paper. 
a rise in non-COVID excess mortality, mental health deterioration, child abuse and domestic violence, widening global inequality, large increases in debt, food insecurity, lost educational opportunities, unhealthy lifestyle behaviors, increased loneliness and social polarization, etc. Unquote. All the sorts of things public health would normally be telling us they're on top of, and this is why we have to regulate every aspect of your life, but here, nowhere to be found. Stay in your house, citizen. National Bureau of Economic Research found that the lockdown unemployment shock, which is a reference to the many millions of people suddenly thrown out of work, is projected to result in somewhere between 840,000 and 1.22 million excess deaths over the next 15 to 20 years. These people are a disaster. Oh, but they must have saved lots of lives, right? There is no connection between anything they did and people's health, zero. Plot the most stringent 25 US states against the least stringent, and the graphs are identical. And that's what Diary of a Psychosis is about. People went berserk for nothing, nothing. No positive effects, nothing. Florida outperformed California in excess deaths. Now that's not supposed to be possible. If we had asked these people in March 2020, what do you think will happen if we have a laissez-faire state, relatively speaking, and a psychotically locked down one, which when they finally allowed Disneyland to reopen, the last Disney property in the world to reopen, it was reopened at 15% and with the instruction, please do not scream while you're on the rides. <laughs> Those screams are involuntary, Gavin Newsom, but. So, you know, the answer that we got from the public health establishment is very interesting because they were on a couple of occasions actually asked a, challenge, a challenging question. Very rare, but it did happen. Andy Slavitt, White House COVID advisor, was asked about this on MSNBC of all places. Why do you think it is that Florida and California, especially when adjusting for age, seem to be doing about the same? What do you think the explanation for that could be? And I'm gonna let you hear his own words for, for yourselves. I have a little site called diaryofcovid.com, and there's like a two to three minute video on there, and it's got some of the greatest hits of Anthony Fauci and Andy Slavitt. And I want you to hear, because you think in the back of your head, maybe they have some really scientific answer to this. No, go to diaryofcovid.com, watch that little video, and see what their answers are. And then think to yourself, my neighbors still trust these people, even after this, <laughs> even after this. So I don't want to spoil it for you. you. You go see for yourselves. To give you a sense of the kind of scientific research we got, we got the study out of Duke University showing that in North Carolina, masks had made children healthier. Now, all the major newspapers reported on this. The New York Times, the Washington Post, and then buried in paragraph 11 was, well, since all kids in North Carolina wore masks, we didn't actually have a control group. <laughs> but the kids did okay, so we think it was the masks. Like, that's not worth anything. That kind of study is worth absolutely nothing. Nothing at all. Now, we were fed this moralizing narrative. You know, if you obey so-called public health, you'll get good results. But if you disobey, you're going to get what's coming to you. And I remember in late 2020, I looked at the numbers for Japan and South Korea and, and the trends, and they had the same ups and downs at exactly the same moments. So I'm supposed to believe those people disobeyed the regulations, then obeyed again, then disobeyed, then obeyed again at exactly the same time in two different countries. Maybe there's another explanation for what's going on here. So that, that's what this is about. That's what this is about. Sweden perform, outperformed all of Europe in excess deaths, despite ostentatiously refusing to go along with it. So these people, the World Health Authorities, did nothing but lie to us about what was happening for several years running, and none of what they foisted on us accomplished a single thing. Well, I take that back. It accomplished one very important thing. It alerted every non-comatose person on this planet 
that the world public health establishment, far from a collection of experts looking out for our best interests, are at best grossly incompetent, and at worst, a downright sinister cabal that any thinking person must resist and denounce. Thank you very much.